Thank you so much. I think as we proceed, we're going to come to see my panelists uh, adjacent to me in the um, in the visual lineup here. And so I'm just going to speak for a moment while um, the team gets that in order. But um, I wanted to just start by saying, well, first of all, how grateful I am to to all the artists in this panel and others who took time out, um, sometimes what felt like at gunpoint from their busy schedules to respond to the works of art that are in Uninvited. I felt that it was really urgent that we, you know, use this project as a way to knit together a sense of continuity between women artists in different generations in this country. Um, there's a bad habit in, in Canada of us forgetting our own history. And, and I think one of the great pleasures for me of this project has been discovering my some of my favorite artists in Canada, discovering their sisters from a century ago. And, um, you know, they went deep in their thinking and in their experiencing of these works. Um, we're going to start with Tracy Williams. And I have a, what we're going to do first is I, I took the liberty. Tracy, I didn't hear back from you about a work that you wanted to speak about. So I just thought that I would show the Coast Salish baskets that are in um, Gallery 8 at the McMichael. It's the first slide, if the team could put that up in our presentation. I don't see. Just slide. one moment, please. <laughs> OK, good. Very reassuring. Just making sure you're out there. What we've done is, you know, the, the, the culminating room of the exhibition is Emily Carr, mostly tree paintings, but also her um, self-portrait and her portrait of um, Sophie Frank. And then in the middle, this is just the moment before we had to put all the plexi bonnets on them, which is always a sad moment in a way, although it, it, the whole thing looks very, very beautiful. Um, this sort of enfilade of these extraordinary baskets with, with you can see Sophie's um, uh, basket forth from the front there. It, it really is a kind of, um, you know, the climax to the show. And what I love about it coming last is that people will have gone through the whole exhibition and not even thought probably about Emily Carr, which when they went into the show for many visitors would be the only woman artist in this show that they would have heard of. So I kind of like the idea of people getting to the end of the show and going, wait a minute, Emily Carr, like I completely, what? You know, so we really we do do a big uh, focus on that here, and then um, equally holding up and ex you know presenting in this very uh, powerful way um, the baskets made by Coast Salish women. These come to us from the collection of the Rom. Unfortunately, a number of these baskets, in, in the typical practice of the you know nineteenth and twentieth century, are not attributed, but a handful of them are. So we're we're glad we have some threads to hold on to here and, and try to unravel their stories. But um, Tracy, I'm wondering if you're with us. Sarah, we've lost Tracy. So if we could move on while we try to get Certainly. Her. Okay. So let's just see the next slide, which is another view of the same gallery where you can sort of see the knitting together of um, the trees and the trees and the things made from the trees um, so expertly by these women weavers. So let's, let's move ahead and talk to Shelley who is such a joy to work with as a writer. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. Apologies, what I can I've, see. I can what see. I've done, what I've done is I've asked every writer to pick a work, not one that they wrote about, but one that kind of blew their mind when they went through the show or went through the catalog to respond to. Um, and and Shelley picked this Tamlaham Upper Skeena River, which is looking a bit fuzzy. It's feeling a bit like we all are, I think, by this time of the day. But uh, hopefully you can still sense its beauty. There we go. Might be better smaller. Yeah. Thank you. Do you should I start? Yeah, so Shelley, tell us. Um, okay. And tell us a little bit before you start. I didn't. I wanted to sort of avoid doing formal introductions. Can you tell us a little bit before you begin just what you're, what you're known for in your painting practice? Uh, you know, I, I hate to trot out the CV, you know, kind of weary CV call of fame, but just tell us what, you know, a little bit about your artistic practice based in Toronto, and then tell us how you read this picture and why you chose it. Okay. Hey, so, Tracy, you're back. Good. Basically, um, I am a figure painter. I have painted landscape, but I don't make my practice of landscape. Um, I mainly work with the figure focused 
pretty much on the face, um, but gesture, body gesture, um, and psychology, you know, psychology of the, of my sitters. Um, I don't always work from life. I, uh, some, I do, I do work from life. I work from photography. I work from my own pictures, basically of my own models. And I work with certain models. I don't work just willy nilly. Uh, not that that's willy nilly. I don't mean that at all. No judgment. <laughs> I mean, I usually know the person quite well, or they're a friend of mine, or they're a child, or, you know, somebody in my life. And so I work from memory sometimes and from that. But I have engaged in landscape a lot, uh, but have never shown my landscapes. And I don't really see them as a serious part of my, my work. I remember the day I saw this painting. I remember walking into the, um, it was in Hamilton, correct? When the Beaver Hall- Yes, it would have traveled with Beaver Hall, yeah. And I remember walking into, I was with some friends and we, we were walking and often what I do when I go to, to uh, exhibitions is I decide which painting I'm going to take home with me. <laughs> and I remember walking into this room because it was sort of at the back, there was, I think, uh, I, if I remember, there might have even been a fireplace in that room. And this was sort of up high on the right. And I remember walking in and thinking, holy cow, like, okay, that's my painting. Mm -hmm. And I just, I could not believe how beautiful it was and how I had never seen it before. Mm -hmm. and those two things just sort of shocked me. That's why when you ask sort of a, uh, a mind blowing picture. I mean, this really was for me mind blowing. It, it sort of, it has everything that, you know, you were talking about whether it's group seven painting um, or not, how it fits into these, you know, the work that was being done at the time. It kind of has everything that, that everybody was working with, uh, rounded forms, um, you know, almost sort of this color palette a little bit, sort of, um, local color a little, you know, sort of, but, but, yeah, but very specific you know, to the coast. Yeah, but yeah. also integrated with other or interrupted with other uh, tones and colors. Um, and yet there was something about this painting that I love more than any of the others, any of the group of seven. I mean, this, this takes precedent for me over my love of landscape painting. Like, this is it. This is the painting. And, you know, even there's a little Lauren Harris in there, you know, with these rounded forms. And I was, you know, I'm not an enormous Lauren Harris fan. I, I really appreciate his work. I do appreciate it. But there was something, you know, maybe a little too spiritual for me. Well, there's um, a really interesting contrast there because, you know, when I think of Harris, you know, I think of, if they have a fault with paintings, it's that they're so static. And I think, you know, in the previous panel, we were just talking about women painting landscapes and about a certain sense we had that the experience of landscape felt, yeah, it seems to dissolve at that bigger scale. Um, the, the, the feeling of, in the painting of the landscape, you know, it seems to imply a, phys a visceral sensation of the landscape, an experience being had in the body of the painter and thus now in the body of the viewer as you look at it. I mean, there is a sort of somatic impact that this picture has when you look at it, hang on the gal gallery wall, it makes your pressure drop. You know, it's, it's extremely physical, the reaction you have in it. And I think we were talking about, you know, I'm looking at the sinuous line and the kind of rhythm of that. And we were talking about that in relationship to Elizabeth Winwood, And of course, in relation to Emily Carr, you know, is, is the question I was posing in that panel is, you know, why doesn't this quite feel like a group of seven painting? And you know, do you think I'm on to something there, Shelley? Well, um, I mean, it doesn't, it, well, actually, you know, in, in some ways it's possible that um, Tom Thompson could have tripped over this, this <laughs> kind of, in one of his small panels. It's possible. <laughs> but, you know, when, when the group of seven was do, were doing their small panels and then translated them to larger panels, mm -hmm. something was lost there too. Yeah. You know, there is, like you say, there is a static quality that is lost. And I should point out this picture is big. It's not yeah. a sketch. It's a robust size, which is 
you're quite right. I mean, a lost gets lost in translation right. when they move from the field sketch to the studio work. You know, when she would have looked out at this landscape, there are so many things that she didn't include. And that's why, you know, it's, it's always really interesting to make, try to make a landscape painting because you see how much information there is. It's overwhelming. And so what she's done is she has decided what she's going to mm -hmm. see, what she's going to include, what she's going to eliminate. And I love all those choices that she made. Mm -hmm. I when you look at the, when you look at the picture, what is the, you know, what is the element that makes the picture work? Because I know you're really good at finding that thing in a painting that. Okay. Well, it's about, <laughs> in this one is a real balance. I mean, the color is mm. incredible. Is there one passage that without it, the picture would fall apart? Like, is there? Um, well, you know, that bright white in the uh, center there, the light on the water, okay, that reflection, uh, that's probably it. I mean, it's, it's sort of like a counterpoint if you think of color in, in a musical way. Yeah. You know, you, you cover that area over and you'll see that it, something doesn't quite work there. Mm. You, you, you take your hand back and see it and it, all of a sudden it, it just pops. Everything pops. Mm. But it is a, it's a reflection and yet, yeah, it works as a device as well. Um, I think it's doing some kind of a tango with that pink beach too. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 that, that sort of um, yellow green or the green yellow, the green gold is exquisite. Like, I mean, take that away, the picture kind of falls apart as well. It does. But all of the, all of the winding mm. movements in that painting. And then, and then at the very end, you have the snowy peaks mm. that are so precise. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like anything was just generalized. It, it's That's incredible it's, work. Yeah, it's, it's just incredible. I absolutely, yeah, I would, I would take that in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people would. I mean, what, what's nice is in the show, you walk in and this is really the first thing that faces you, this and an array of the Skeena sketches on either side of it. And, and the objective was to have a work that was so extraordinary that people would walk into the show and say, how could I not know? about yeah. about this person who is this person you know and in fact that's exactly what what people are doing they're just it, it's like this you know uh proof of you know patriarchal obfuscation in art history that, that this woman is not better known and she's doing exactly. powerful work with this painting in our show exactly and there is no doubt that the guys would have seen this and known what a brilliant painting it was yeah. like without question yeah. so why Anne Savage, you know, I've always, I've known about Anne Savage for a long time. She, uh, my, my husband's family is from Montreal. And I yep. did hear that my father-in-law studied or had some art courses with Anne Savage. Um, Hi, like she's always lady. been around in that, the, their family sort of mentioned. Um, so mm -hmm. I was really curious about her a long time ago. Yeah. But I just, I still don't understand why... <laughs> you know, why this wasn't the painting that I got to study when I was in right. art school, sitting in first year art history. Why wasn't it this one? Well, I mean, I think we are finding change. And I think the, you know, young men and women that are on this call will most definitely, when they are teaching art history, if they, those of them that aren't already, are putting artists like Anne Savage front and center. Um, we should move on maybe to Sherry Boyle. And then Tracy, I think we'll circle back to you at the end. Uh, because we just we just lost you at the beginning there. But Sherry, can you um, can we advance to the next slide and see what Sherry has for us? Uh -huh. Hi, hi. It's so nice to see. You. That was really interesting, Shelley. I really love listening to an artist's interpretation who knows so well the movements and edits and thoughts of how to apply color composition and recognizes that innately through my lived experience. That's key. It's so, so interesting. So would you like me to just go ahead and do the same? Kind of yes. Thing tell, us a little bit, tell us a little bit about your practice. I'm sure you're well known to all the people sure. on the call, but. Uh, my name is Sherry Boyle. I live in Toronto. I'm from this region. Um, 
And my work is mainly figurative, but it's really about kind of translating a personal experience, a very idiosyncratic experience of my inner world, uh, the things that I care and think about and my imagination and how that relates to the outer world, which is in no way limited to art history or art dialogue um, at all. It's often influenced by every kind of spectrum of experience of what I'm reading, looking at, thinking about, seeing in the greater world at large. So it's very um, interesting for me. And I do like express things narratively through kind of um, mise-en-scenes between subjects, perhaps, uh, or imaginary characters. So seeing kind of um, the figure, looking at figurative work, uh, I relate to that as a character. And I'm interested in technique, of course, and materiality because I'm multimedia artist. So I've worked in sculpture, painting, drawing, performance, um, etc. So I chose this particular work to kind of launch into because of its incredible powerfulness of the series that are included in the book that Michelle Jacques spoke so eloquently about in her essay. And I really encourage anybody, obviously, to read this piece that's so important as a perspective on these particular works. And I chose this particular work because I'm a, as a white woman and a figurative artist, I think about the politics of representation. And it's super interesting because number one, I am struck by these paintings more so than the other. And I'm going to say something really unpopular probably, <laughs> but I am as a generalized general generally the works in the show um, or the works of that period even the, it's the people that create the women that created them I'm more interested in than the works themselves just mm -hmm. as an individual of how I look at the work I'm curious about their lives I'm curious how yeah. they operated as artists at the time who they were what their circumstances were what their politics were how they were constrained or how they expressed themselves and bust out of those constraints but this is the only artwork in the show where I'm more interested in the subject. I'm more interested in that woman, who she is, than I am about Prudence Heward. Mm -hmm. So here, I mean, it's also obviously a white woman painting a Black subject in a time of extreme anti-Blackness. And, you know, Michelle speaks about it much more eloquently, but the response to this work was very racist and only could be so painful uh, for anybody kind of reading that now, especially that's mm -hmm. not white. Like the, the whiteness that was so deep in our culture is so prevalent when you look at this image, these images and this woman's face, what's so spectacular is she's, it's very difficult to paint a portrait where someone feels so real when their expression, this woman is looking not she's looking at us but she's looking kind of past us past us mm -hmm. and um that self-contained the depth of her experience that can't be accessed that is almost being kind of tolerated i feel like her you know but and again i don't want to um read things into this because i feel there's a dignity and a kind of not my place to say what was in her mind mm -hmm. um but as a respondent to the work i can say she was a real person. She's not named. She's, uh, you know, these, these has been lost to history and the artist chose not to include her as an individual with a name. So that says so much right there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can't discount the reality of this person, regardless of the stylized backgrounds or the context that the artist placed them in. So to me, I'm looking at art so much more as a kind of symbolic language that will allow us to perhaps look into history and think about the values of the people that created it, the imaginations of the people that created it, and look into those relationships. So I could break down the kind of technique stuff, which is quite beautiful, I think, the painting. Um, but really, I just wish I knew more about this woman. About um, mm -hmm. And I also think, too, as a white woman who works in figures, I think often about the politics, as I said, of representation and how do I portray other people than white people um, when my own experience is only white as a settler in Canada. So I have that as a really rich and really complicated subject to work with. But life is such an incredible tapestry of people and I feel in a way like 
there's some of the earlier images that are in the book that I didn't choose, even though they're very striking and have a similar situation of like the girl in the window and Hester and the first one. Um, they have that kind of striking quality of real people, but I also feel like there's something that has been captured that's so like a kind of abject expression that felt that feels like not worthy of the subject somehow, even though that might be a really ac accurate to their experience in that moment and what was being captured was real. I don't feel as a white woman. Um, it's my place to kind of present somebody else that I'm not, mm -hmm. I can't uh, pretend to understand their experience in a light that might look so kind yeah. of downtrodden, you know? You know, it's so interesting that you see objection. And I mean, this is why a Heward is just a field day for interpretation because everyone sees these pictures so differently, but I, I see this as a very different kind of picture than Dark Girl, for example, in which she, it, that picture reads to me, you know, very much as abjection, the rounded shoulders, the, the slack facial features, the sense of, you know, kind of scarcely concealed despair that I see in that painting. Other colleagues oh, cool. in the gallery see it very differently. They just see it as the, the typical Prudence Heward, you know, uh, sort of bummed out face that is, you know, like she does not, she does not paint happy. And actually when she does paint happy, it looks absolutely appalling. She did a number of family portraits of children that are really hard to look at. But, you know, this, this picture, well, you know, she's like fitting yeah. in with her family, however she could, right? But but um, this picture does not strike me as abject to look at. I mean, I think no, 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 it's not. I, that's why I chose this one. That's why I yeah, chose. Yeah, she's got such a sense of like internal fire, and you know, you know that title that was put on that you know the show um, of Prudence here at Expressions of Will. Um, such a fitting title for for an exhibition on on Prudence Heward because she looks extremely determined, very self contained, and this bizarre thing that Heward does with not allowing us to connect with the eyes of her mm -hmm. sitters. And it's almost like, you know, it's not something that one sees consistently mm -hmm. in, in an artist producing portraits, but mm -hmm. almost invariably, the person is just missing us. And it, it is what gives that kind of sense of not giving over. And I, I, sometimes I wonder with Heward if that's like coming from a woman's perspective of being looked at all the, you know, as one is, you know, that she wants to give sort of confer on her sitters in some way a kind of essential inwardness that we don't have access to and that that makes us very uncomfortable when we look at the paintings. Well it's interesting in this moment to talk about that idea of the gaze because W. D. Dubois, B. Dubois was famous for talking about the double gaze of African Americans experience being themselves and also looking at themselves being looked at as something that was perceived and invented outside of their own experience of self. So that kind of double gaze here is could also come into play with a picture like this that really complicates it. And then there's also a feminist reading with the double gaze as women will be conscious of having their own version of that, of like, we are who we are inside, but then there's the way that other people look at us yeah. Yeah. and expect things of us. So if she, you know, this is the thing though, I have to say as an artist is that once we're dead, it, no one knows what actually we were doing. And there's a whole kind of institution based on interpreting artists that can sometimes really take the risk of putting words in the mouth of people and, and making art history. And then people in the future reading it as truth. And I myself as a living artist really struggle with this because I've quietly slipped into museums of my exhibitions and listened to docents or even curators <laughs> speak about my work and without anybody in that tour group knowing I'm the artist and they're getting it completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And so this is common, you know, because there's so many assumptions and we can only speak at things through our own yes. education or own context or own perspective and we know how complicated that is with every individual has their own you know wild myriad of, of yeah. feelings right so that kind of authority that can take place is like I really hesitate at that I really appreciate um, having artists as a part of a symposium like this because mm. sometimes it can feel like there's a whole um, realm of machinery in developing machinery Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's like yeah. kind of we're doing a big giant giraffe museum and every single person gets to talk about the giraffe except the giraffe. <laughs> but like who knows more about being a giraffe than a giraffe? <laughs> so like invite Well, you and then you get Shelly uh, Sherry, you get artists like um Emily Carr who grabbed a hold of that narrative and wrote it herself. 
mm-hmm. in ways that were actually quite obfuscating. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, like they're yeah. actually when you read, I mean, Carr, everyone, you know, extols Carr as a writer or commonly does, but I find it almost comical the the degree to which she is, you know, quite obviously, you know, we think the group of seven were good at branding. I mean, she, you know, she was like uh, notorious for characterizing herself in a very particular way that she knew would travel through mass culture. So, but hey, in the end, that's her voice and that's yeah. she chose to. Yeah, go out and that's true to put herself history. out like that. Yeah. You know, so in, in that's her. It was a strategy and a, and a brilliant one. As yeah. A yeah. And yeah. it's a vulnerable. Although you need to dig underneath it yeah. still. You yeah, know? for sure. But any of our digging can only be theoretical. Mm-hmm. You know, this is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we're left with the work. Mm-hmm. Um, Panya, of course, you wrote, you know, you wrote in the catalog so brilliantly about Paraskeva. And, you know, we continue to go, um, you know, back and forth on some of the family lore <laughs> about, <laughs> about Paraskeva, the dating of things. We're about to go into a second printing. So if you if your yeah, family has any last minute thoughts about that bath scene from Leningrad, please, yeah, yeah. please let me know. In the oh, meantime. I'm just chuckling to myself on the other end of Shelley's uh, uh, commentary, you know, um, or sorry, Sher- Sherry's, Sherry's commentary, pardon me. Um, let's advance the slide to Atatsiak's. Yeah, Atatsiak's were, oh, uh, this just for me, uh, just goes right to the heart of my own heart, but also just, I think, uh, just to dive into it, I mean, I have a whole a whole necklace of notes in my book uh, from today's conversations that could lead in so many different directions uh, with Paris Cava's work and the context of her coming to Canada and landing Toronto in Toronto in the 1930s after being in Paris in the 1920s and th- living through the Russian Revolution and um, you know, and I think about her Banya paintings and her longing to have, to be working alongside other women, to mm-hmm. be in a social dynamic where there was some uh, sense of camaraderie and 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 power in in numbers. And when I look at uh, Atatsiatsk's work, and I think about these beads being handed down from her mother and her grandmother and that she reworked those outfits time and time again not outfits but her I mean reworked her identity really had this had this fluid capacity to take to take the artwork apart and reconfigure it to reintroduce herself yeah time and time again season after season I mean I'm romanticizing it of course because that's what I do often. <laughs> but, you know, just... I think you're right. I mean, I, I think that's, it was about presentation of self and declaration of, the, of your family and, you know... Yeah, and I think about, I mean, important. one of the things that I think is of critical importance in, the, in our moment is our ability, I'm a settler of settler ancestry, although Paris Gava came in 1931 and my other three... Um, grandparents had been born here and their parents had been born you know so the the history within Ontario had gone back much much further than Paris Gava did and we were really part you know my grandparents were part of the establishment um you know the Toronto establishment so um but you know having been born and raised in Toronto and being completely unaware that we were living on stolen land or any of that indigenous history is just, it's just shocking to me now. And I think about how different it would have been for Paris Gava to um, have any contact with indigenous peoples that were so connected to the land in ways that were so integrated into their cultural expression Mm -hmm. Um, and what effect that would have had. And I can't forget, you know, that Paris gave a, on her tombstone, you know, that it says, but, you know, when, when, when the flowers begin to appear, I talk to them, you Mm -hmm. know, that she had this double faith of, in, in the Russian way of Mm -hmm. this, this uh, pagan in the earth, you know, her hands in the earth and her garden became, you know, so critically important to her as she aged. And I think uh, also in Paris Gava, like you see this 
longing for a place that you belong, you know, longing for a homeland, which is, you know, expressing a love and a sense of connectedness to a specific place. I mean, she cultivated her garden, but her place that she yearns for in every kind of way in her paintings is Russia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, 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 uh, I'm sure in her own time, she would not have, um, you know, who who knows what kind of exposure she might have had to the presence of indigenous people in Canada? I mean, I can only imagine in that period how completely, you know, the complete erasure of that. But it's interesting to me that you you pick this with with its you know with its caribou teeth. I mean, you know, uh, garnished off the off the landscape. You know, when one finds these things, um, the caribou teeth, of course, make a beautiful sound when you move. Um, the beads handed down from her mother. It's very much an object about belonging somewhere. And I think that's what's so powerful about your your grandmother's work is that it's really about struggling to belong somewhere. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of that you've drifted to this kind of intrigues me. Oh, yeah, there's, you know, I mean, and 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 her quote at the beginning of the book about about the the process of the growth of the nation's art and the process of the growth of the soul and the conscience being, you know, our consciousness about where we are, who we are, uh, the stories that we carry, um, knowing our stories. I mean, I think that she, yeah, she sort of starts in that quote saying it's that you know the art records the soul of a nation, but which is very straight out of the Group of Seven playbook. But then she takes, I mean, it's, it's from a speech that she made in the 1940s, but then she clarifies and says, the conscience of a nation is contained in its artwork. That's a very different thing than the soul, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is, you know, the idea, obviously, that she so famously brings with her from her European experience. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that, that when we talked about the oneness or when Christina, Christina, I just, I just loved your, your um, presentation. And when we, when, when you talked about the, the oneness and, you know, this kind of the two sides of this coin of being one with the world, but then in the European context, the individuality, the oneness of the individ individuality, the Western sort of notion that Paris gave a carry that, you know, we needed to lock the door on the room to have our exclusive time to ponder over and wrestle with how to make art individually. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, in, in, in the brashness of my 1920s, and I know Diana Nemiroff is on, is on here. I remember showing at the National Gallery when I was in my 20s and being interviewed and sort of proclaiming uh, courageously, maybe, or naively, I would say now, uh, 40 years later, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, we could, as women move beyond, you know, many of these limitations. And um, coming out of 20 years of parenting, I feel more of an affinity with Paris Gave every day, mm -hmm. you know, in the actual loneliness of art making for women, mm -hmm. particularly, you know, and so I think, um, yeah, there are just there were so many things I thought about the privilege of responsibility, you know, and mm -hmm. trying to carry Paris gave us legacy, but then in this modern idea, you know, like working with Gerald McMaster recently, he often says Indigenous people were always modern. We've always been modern. We've always adapted and responded to the present moment that we're in. And and I think about, you know, how can I be modern as a legacy of Paraskeva? You know, what do I do as an artist mm -hmm. that actually carries her legacy more than, even though I do need to write her uh, catalog resume. It's on ah, yes. to do this, But, you know, <laughs> get on that, will you, Pam? How, how, how do we actually, <laughs> as her, you know, as her ancestor, how do I yeah. actually yeah. carry her, her, totally. her spirit? Yeah. Exactly. in the world exactly yeah. yeah thank you so much for that panya and louis um who grappled with uh loring and wild for us in the catalog and has chosen if you if you back up the slide to the one previous you'll find a wonderful crazy crazy painting uh by peggy nickel mcleod um the tangled garden do you want to take us through that louis and just tell us a little bit about yourself before you start what your interests have been and you're here in Toronto and up. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Super, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah, for organizing this panel. And it's great to hear everybody's perspectives and their chosen artworks. Uh, it's like little windows into people's worlds, both the artists that we're seeing, but also the artists that have selected these artworks. They're mm -hmm. kind of dual windows happening. So, I just realized a minute ago that I'm getting an extra set of essays from all of you. This is really not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm, and I work as an artist, uh, and I also work as a curator. Mm -hmm. And recently, I curated an exhibition at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto titled Formful Fiction, Art and Artists in Toronto. So I was looking at some 80 artists uh, from many, many, many generations uh, uh, and trying to kind of understand if we look at the work of Toronto artists, many of them don't depict Toronto necessarily, but assuming that their sense of place appears in the artwork nevertheless, not as representation, but in other ways, I was curious to see what can I glean about Toronto based on the work made in this place? So I've been looking at, at a lot of work and thinking about it in two, let's say metaphors stood out. Um, and this is, I would say in the work of um, settler artists as well as in the work of indigenous artists that I looked at, the work kind of could orbit around two prevalent metaphors. I'm sure there are more, but mm -hmm. these are the two that I noticed. On, on the one hand is the metaphor of the vacant lot. So looking at the world around you and saying, meh, there's nothing here. Uh, obviously this is uh, a, a way of seeing, a way of being that um, has deep roots in the colonial imagination, right? The idea of ter terra nullius, uh, even of the idea of the new world is another way of saying there's nothing here until I got here. Uh, but it's a, it's a way to describe the environment as a kind of vacant lot. The real thing is in here, uh, it's somewhere else. Um, as a counterpoint to that metaphor of the vacant lot, I started noticing another metaphor, which I call the tangled garden. So quite in distinction from the environment being a place where there's nothing uh, worth seeing, when through the lens of the tangled garden, there's almost too much to see. There's a kind of uh, 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 exuberance of life um, and uh, a kind of complexity and entanglement that is almost too much to account for. There's so much uh, in this tangled garden. And, and I, I realized that this opposition between these two metaphors structures a lot of the art made in this place. So that's something that I explored as a curator doing the exhibition. And I'm also work, uh, exploring that as an artist. Uh, so I have a, a painting at, in a group shop at the Tell Brown Gallery right now uh, called uh, On a Vacant Lot. That is my way to imagine a kind of vision of entanglement and, and layering. And so for that reason, I looked at this, uh, I was paying attention to this work by Peggy Nichol McLeod, The Tangled Garden. Um, maybe I'll add one more thing. I've also, I don't know why, but I, I've noticed uh, as I was preparing for today, I, I noticed that I'm interested in twins and doubles and almost like Siamese twins. So when I wrote for the catalog, uh, I wrote about the, the twin artists, uh, Francis Loring and Florence Wilde. They're two individual artists, obviously, mm -hmm. but they're very much twinned in the discourse and in the history and narration. Uh, and in this painting of Peggy Nichol McLeod's, I also observe a kind of twin. Um, it's the twin of this painting that she made. Uh, it's another painting titled Tangle Garden by J.E.H. MacDonald. Mm. Uh, so that one was painted in 1916 and Peggy Nicola McLeod painted this in 1935. So almost 20 years later, she wanted to describe her own idea of a tangled garden. 
And so I became interested in both this kind of call and response mm -hmm. uh, over time um, uh, in the span of 20 years, but also what did Peggy herself bring to this uh, metaphor of the tangled garden? So I was looking at the painting when I visited the McMichael last night and noticing how hallucinogenic it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, the colors are very vibrant. Um, they're, they've got a kind of dreamlike quality to them. Uh, they're not the colors that one expects to see if I look out into a, a garden. Uh, they're a kind of uh, trippy version of, of what one might see. Uh, so the colors are very unusual, very weird. The shapes are very weird. They're these kind of tendrils and pentacles and the two amazing gourds have a kind of, they're almost like uh, subjects, like human figures. Um, they have this kind of presence there, this, this amazing volumes and this kind of body of them. Uh, and also I noticed when I was looking at the painting in person, there's this incredible confusion of foreground and background. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to tell what lies close to you as a viewer and what lies distant from you as a viewer. There's this weird kind of meshing of foreground and background. And uh, this is really striking in many of her paintings in the exhibition, this kind of very surreal quality of her, her paintings. There, there's a self-portrait where her eyes are very intense. There's almost like, almost like a bloodshot mm -hmm. under her eyes as if she's been looking so hard. Her eyes are almost kind of um, <laughs> responding True. organically. Uh, there's another portrait of a, a young girl, I think, uh, that also has this very surreal uh, quality to it. So I was intrigued by this idea of the Tangled Garden, um, comparing it to J.H. MacDonald. Um, you know, his, his paintings, his painting is also very weird and very dreamlike and very hallucinogenic. But by comparison to this one, his is much more earthly, earthy. Yeah, it's much easier to see. Of, it's, you, you feel the ground under your feet. Yes, right? yes. With McDonald, but this is like you're kind of floating. And I think I'm finding myself wondering what Sherry's thinking because she wrote about Peggy Nichol McLeod for the catalog so beautifully. And she wrote about the incomparable descent of lilies, which I think is, uh, you know, right up there with the very best of O'Keefe or Frida Kahlo, like a monumental uh, painting, sort of dealing with female physical life, physical experience, sexual experience, embodiedness. Um, curious to see what Sherry sees here in the Tangled Garden. Uh, do you want to say something, Sherry? It'd be wonderful to hear. Oh, yeah, here I am. That's nice to ask me. Thank you. I just It's super interesting to hear you speak about it, Louis. It's very beautiful. And all the things you're talking about, I actually wrote down that her, her colors or her are like an acid trip at the exact same time you said that it was like some kind of trip or like LSD experience. Acid, you know, I was reading the chat and I was going. <laughs> Pager, yeah, because it's, I mean, really it's just those reds and greens are very acidic and they're quite um, like they're striking and her palette is carries through a lot of her work like that. And they're very unconventional colors to use together because they're not pleasing necessarily. They're quite <laughs> acerbic. Um, but in that grounding thing, I mean, there's anything from that, like, it's actually quite a skilled thing to make work look like it's uh, that or like that's a European thing. Also, the perspective, as opposed to a flat kind of designed um, for like picture plane, but she might have not either had, although she was completely trained and educated and so deeply passionate about painting from what I've read and understand, mm -hmm. um, she might, it might have been just like not having the total like technical skills to really deepen that background and make it look like it goes off. But I think what it's more likely is that 
she just didn't care about that reality because she was really responding to maybe her inner experience of like cosmic kind of sexy mm. joy that she had the sensual joy of painting which no one speaks about if you haven't painted if you haven't ever had like a passionate relationship to paint it's really sexy and it's really gooey and you can get really absorbed into the zone when it's on and it seemed like for her it was always on like she always wanted to do it she was like so when I see this I see like you know, she's just not concerned with the boundaries of reality. Mm. And, and maybe also as a woman, like those, like we have to kind of step back from reality sometimes. And I especially imagine, especially at her time, like all those years ago, because reality wasn't always like a pleasant place to be or an accepting, welcoming place to be. It could be threatening. It could be really, you could be really locked out of it. So you retreat often to your own imagination and your own kind of place that you've invented. And I see that in her work. It's just like a wild cacophony of her inner kind of imaginings, right? It's Sounds familiar, Sherry. Yeah, I, I relate. <laughs> like, that's kind of why I chose her as the artist. That's the realist, sexy thing. It's like something very resonates. Well, the other thing is, you know, we've been talking about the sensuality in the paintings oh, a lot today. And, you know, the other thing is the way in which the paint hand, you can see it, so the, the larger of the gourds and the green leaves in front of it, they have this kind of um, slightly emulsified way of laying the paint on that makes them kind of fuzzy feeling when you're looking at them you can't quite grab them uh, visually they kind of you know they kind of hover there so I mean to me that gives gives me a very strong like physical sensation as I look at the pictures as well so she's she's a master of that mm -hmm. so so yeah. maybe just one last thing just to yes, of course. riff off of what Sherry said I noticed yeah. that in this painting uh the artist uh, she walked further away from the house than J.H. McDonald did. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his painting of the Tangle Garden is kind of, the house is just next door to yeah. the garden. And mm -hmm. here, Peggy has walked further away from the house. And it evokes what Sherry's been talking about in this mm -hmm. sense of like going into your own zone. Immersion. And sometimes needing to push away the other zone in order to kind of uh, cultivate your own perception yes uh, children so even the, the dishes in there. Is there yeah yeah fascinating yeah. artist and fascinating it is, but i mean it, it seems impossible to believe that she gave this work this title without thinking of a direct riposte to to her group of seven you know predecessor mm -hmm. so a wonderful thing to bring forward to us thank you so much louis thank you. so i um i just think we have about oh we have about 10 minutes left um together and I, I just, I guess I, I wonder overall, I think all of you have, have looked at the catalog and most of you have seen the exhibition. Any thoughts to share like as working, oh, Tracy, my goodness, there you are. Can we please back up to the first and second slide? My deep apologies. Tracy, I didn't, thank you. I didn't get um, um, a callback from you about selecting another work than the works that, um, that you wrote about. And so I decided to just turn these beautiful Coast Salish baskets over to you for the last word. And I have two pictures of them. This one of the sort of enfilade of baskets and then the second one, which shows them in relationship to the Emily Carr painting of trees. So I don't know which picture you'd prefer to, to, to speak to, but um, let me turn it over to you and my apologies for skipping. That, that's not a problem at all. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Thank you so much. And hot and swallow and quince quach no me up teat seats. So send me a queen snow to no chantla homultus and oho mail on one ox and swallow. And just wanted to share a little bit with you to um, thank you for inviting me to come and to be here with each and every one of you today. I have a good feeling in my heart. My ancestral name is Sesemia, and um, I'm at the village of uh, Capilano right now. And <clears throat> just really um, grateful to, to be here and to, to recall that quite a few years ago, uh, Christina came to uh, North Vancouver and we sat together outside on a, on a bench and had this long conversation about um, Sophie Frank or as we would have known her, so Wayne Chalwit. Okay. And 
since that conversation, I've had the opportunity to kind of go back and to talk to more community members and to um, try to grasp, uh, you know, another understanding of what that relationship might have been like and how how people today in our village um, w- would have looked at something like this. So to start with, um, I just I just want to say that um, um, I'm I'm a basket weaver myself. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Good. Okay, here I'm just gonna plug in. I'm not sure why. Oh goodness. There you are. Okay, sorry. Um, my I come from a long line of basket weavers. So my grandmother, my great great grandmother, and many generations before that all made baskets and in in this time period we're talking about um, a time and a place where a lot of um, Squamish women and other Indigenous women were creating basketry and selling their baskets as a way to support their families mm-hmm. and that that's actually a really kind of interesting important component because I believe that's partly some of the connection between Emily and Sophie Frank was around the basketry. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's, it's amazing because to me, when I look at that, what I see is such a depth of knowledge around the land, how we know land, how do we, what did she have to do to make those baskets? Cause you couldn't buy the materials. You actually had to go out. You had to understand the nature of the tree itself to know that when you're looking at these baskets, you're looking at a cedar tree. Sophie would have been out there probably after spring and she would have been able to look up at the tree that was growing in sand, go underneath the furthest branch and go straight down and dig in the sand and go backwards. And when she was done, she would take that root and then she would have to recover and rebury all the earth there. And she would have been able to split the root, cut it, use a knife to thin it, and store it for a while. And some of these baskets, like when I when I think about like sometimes also about the function part of it, you know, we're talking about berry picking baskets, we're talking about baby baskets, we're talking about baskets as being a part of everyday, everyday life. This, this is who we are. And then for the cooking baskets, like I started doing some work around trying to reclaim ancestral knowledge because there's very few people today who can create um, waterproof cedar root baskets. And as far as I know, the cedar roots are the only ones that can become waterproof, depending on how tight mm-hmm. you weave it, depending on the direction, all of these kinds of things. So there's this really like deep a deep layer of knowledge that that was passed down over over generations of time that come to this point today where we're really trying to rebuild some of this and one of the things that I came across in my research was a picture of Sophie and Emily Carr sitting together and Sophie is teaching Emily how to weave a root basket and one of her children is actually inside of the basket (laughs) and you know, I, I find it I find it kind of kind of amazing and beautiful. You know, like I I made a um, a piece of cedar bark clothing for one of our dear elders a while ago because I loved Sophie's patterns. Her her perception of movement is stunning to say the least, and I really thought that as as a weaver that my my artwork becomes a form of healing. And I, I, I thought I couldn't imagine the number of children that Sophie lost. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't live to be very old. That that graveyard where her children were buried and were not allowed to be buried inside the fence. That um, that graveyard's still there today. Mm-hmm. We still use that site today. It's not just one point in time. There's continuity. Where Sophie and her husband live, our people still live there today. It's, it's an ongoing history. And one thing like 
I think when Christina interviewed me, I hadn't started learning our language yet. Mm -hmm. But I found it really interesting because I talked to my teacher, who's um, Dr. Peter Jacobs, and Dr. Peter Jacobs learned from Auntie Tina Cole, and Auntie Tina Cole was babysat by Sophie Frank, who taught her how to speak Squamish language. Mm -hmm. And what I, I just think when you when you think about something like this, that it gives you a different, maybe a different perspective, a different point of view of what it might have been like for for somebody like Sophie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it it provided a really beautiful opportunity as well to also like think about her ancestral name because to Squamish people our names are very important and so Angelwood yeah. is a name that's still carried today that's used by one of her descendants. And that's, that's like, um, when you, you carry a name like that, it, it's like carries that strength forward with you. Mm -hmm. So when you need help, you can call upon that help to be uh, surrounded by you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the exhibition, we had these baskets, as I say, in this long, um, you know this long display case um, in this in this very large room, and what's interesting you can't quite see it. It would be in the upper right corner, but um, paintings by Carr that depict clear cutting, and of course she famously referred to the stumps in her paintings as screamers, and she wrote a lot about the environmental um, degradations of, you know, of capitalist resource extraction and the greed of people turning trees into money. She was she was on to environmentalism, you know, in a in a very passionate but also very intelligent and insightful way, and it's it's extremely powerful, you know. Thanks to your writing, I've been able to appreciate a little bit more about the fact that the basket is is the actual weaving is the tip of this enormous I, I, iceberg of knowledge underneath it of like as you were just starting to explain like when to take the cedar root, where it's going to grow straight, how long to bury it, in which clay, at what time, for how long, and then, and then, you know, and that there's just like layers and layers of knowledge that both come down through generations that are thinking seven generations ahead, but also that are in this really sensitive, uh, gentle dance with nature as opposed to the sort of violent short-term resource extraction of clear cutting that Emily Carr is, is you know, talking about in, in the paintings that are hanging just, just to the right there on that wall, including scorned as timber, beloved of the sky. And it's, uh, you know, it's a very powerful way to end the exhibition. And, and uh, my thanks to you for helping me to understand that better and for all of us. Thank you. Today. Um, we are close to closing time. So I'm wondering, at the end of a long and rather extraordinary day, I think I wonder if if anyone here has some thoughts about where we are now versus where we were a hundred years ago. We've spent the day looking at the struggle of these women. Um, are we there yet? As our children used to say in the back of the car, um, what are the big obstacles now? I mean, I think one of the things that was really important to us at McMichael is that the show and it shows in the in the the loans the shipping costs of this show it shows in the the sheer heft of the book the 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 proliferation of of color illustrations within it the fact that all of the indigenous materials were custom rephotographed in order that they would have the sheer visual force be you know be able to to hold up and really sing on the pages alongside the sculptures and paintings of their the settler contemporaries. Um, uh, and now I've completely forgotten my train of thought, but um, do we, you know, we realize that part of the reason that, that women's art has not been um, as well known is that while art historians have been doing excellent work in this field for, for decades, they have been, the projects have been under-resourced. And so, you know, we were determined this time to make the project appropriately resourced for for an exhibition of this of this ambition is resources devoted to the art by women an ongoing problem in terms of telling our stories today hmm. or what are the obstacles 
to men and women coming to an equal place. And silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do we have enough time to speak about the history of capitalism and where we're at now? <laughs> <laughs> let's take five minutes and talk yeah. about that, and then let's all go have a drink <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's hard to uh, that's a massive question i think it is and um you know we're talking about value and who values what and what are the institutions and like what you know art art is commodified and and um you know people want a return on their investment Mm -hmm. And so who's considered a good investment that they're going to get a return on the people at the top that are going to be giving money for things. Mm -hmm. And that's always a, a much harder, I think, I mean, that like the intersections of race and gender and sexuality yeah. and all of that is just being a, um, a question of who wants to fund it and who wants who's going to say, see that as valuable for the future. And there's an anticipation, I think, that there has been historically that an exhibition um, of uh, work by a woman artist will draw less attendance and maybe the books won't sell as well. And so we better make the plates black and white. And I mean, it's actually quite shocking when you look at, you know, how few properly um, illustrated in color and, and you know, with, with long and comprehensive essays, like how few Canadian historical artists have been given that, that kind of... Um, that kind of treatment. So, I mean, I, I will say in a note of optimism uh, that this was a, a show that people really rushed forward to support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe that wouldn't have been the case 10 or 15 years ago, but, yeah. you know, maybe I have Donald Trump to thank um, for our ability to get this show properly resourced. It was, a, it was definitely, you know, two, three years ago, a, mo a moment of heated feminist outrage. And we hope that that outrage has not dimmed particularly in the intervening time because we've, we're not where we need to be, obviously. But you know, I, I, it was heartening to me that people were like, yes. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's historical too. And I think that's easier to sell than contemporary in, in a way, because now we've had established value of maybe perhaps some of those paintings or those artworks. Mm -hmm. It takes time for people to take a risk. People don't like to take a risk in the moment necessarily. They want to sit back, especially in Canada and wait and see who's going to be the first one to, you know, commit to something. Mm -hmm. But I do feel as a woman artist, I can say one ongoing issue is um, very hard to feel trusted. It's a, it's uh -huh. a, kind of, it's a, it's almost an issue of like being trusted that you, that what you're doing is, is um, valuable, that what you're saying is honest or authentic, that it's, um, that you, that, that the caliber of what you're saying is kind of in the same category as uh, some of your maybe perhaps male contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So in a way it kind of comes down to a very similar feeling of like, it's hard to feel trusted yeah uh, that, that or like, to be granted maybe, your authority you know yeah yeah, thinker, yeah that, right? that you're in a you're a trusted authority that's a very difficult yeah. thing to 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 hold that authority you can almost sense it's being questioned and i think that goes across you know the map for many people mm -hmm. but uh, that's just my own personal like mm -hmm. trying to unravel it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'd Thank be curious you. about whatever anybody else yes said. exactly other thoughts before we say good night panya talk to us. Yeah, you know, I think from an artist's perspective, one of the things that I've really bumped up against is, is um, a sense that the exhibition space, the aspect of putting my work on display has become somewhat of a stumbling block. It's almost antithetical to the, to the intent of the work, or the, you know, when I, when I think about um, the works that we've been talking about, the in works that are made by Indigenous women and, and, and how they live, where the works live, where the works are alive. And I think that there's a correlation somehow. I mean, I would leave it up to scholars to explore, but a kind of correlation between the intent behind the work that I make as an artist or perhaps many other people that are of the female sexuality or sex, you know, make that somehow there's, 
there's a deep desire that our works stay in the world, that they don't get put into darkened storerooms. Mm -hmm. And somehow there's a mysterious uh, and complex relationship that I think that we have to the Western colonial frameworks that have been created for artworks to be shown. And so it's an energetic, it's, I, I think, it, you know, of course, within the scope of what we're talking about, when I look at it through the lens of scholarship, through the museums, through the desire of us as a society to exhibit the works of women or to see the works of women, there's something deeper within it that, 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 that is, um, that affects that, that um, space somehow. I don't know. I've touched on that in a very mm -hmm. undefined way, but but there's a kind of resistance that I feel as an artist now to putting my work on display. Mm -hmm. And it's a weird thing because I feel like I've taken myself on some levels for mm -hmm. actually, and especially since having children on some levels, yeah. taken myself out of the art world. Well, there's certainly a lot of women in Uninvited who did the same, whether it's Regina Seiden or... Um, Kathleen Munn or you know whoever it is that simply stepped back at a certain point often in Margaret Watkins you know often in response to some kind of deeply felt disappointment um, and we see those suspended careers throughout Uninvited and we just kind of hold them I feel like this this exhibition this project is a way for us 100 years later to kind of you know hold them <laughs> and uh, you know send our send our thoughts out there um, yeah. you know, to, th to think that they, you know, would not know that an artist like Kathleen Munn, like such a genius artist, mm. that she would not necessarily know that we would be looking so carefully and in such rapture at the beautiful things that she made. Mm -hmm. Louie, I wanted to ask you and, um, and, and Tracy and, and Shelly, if you have any closing thoughts before we, before we go. Well, um, uh, just, way, to, just to add to uh, the conversation right now is what we, what you've what we're doing here is it sort of mirrors where the world is as well. I mean, the art world is not a special, uh, unique place where women were not known and and shown and talked about and the difficulties of having children and having a practice at the same time. I mean, it it mirrors what the world what we're all going through. So. Um, it's, 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 you know, continue the fight. You know? I was very delighted to see a nursing mother on our panel this afternoon. Right. That, night, that night had not been the case. That was, before. yeah, that was, that was really <laughs> yes. incredible. Anyway, look at, thank you all so much for being with us. Uninvited is going to be up until mid January at the McMichael and please come and spend time with us and come back again and bring your friends. Um, I wanted to point out one of the notes in the, in the margin here is saying, is it traveling? Yes, it is. It leaves us in mid-January, opens in February in Calgary, and then travels on next summer for a long run at the Vancouver Art Gallery. So it will see new horizons. And, um, and my, my deep thanks to you all for your solidarity in this project and your beautiful writing and your fa fabulous thoughts today. We've been so privileged to just be able to step around inside your minds for this hour. Thank you so much.